There was a time in my demented youth when somehow I suspected that the truth about survival after death was known to every human being. I alone knew nothing, and a great conspiracy of books and people hid the truth from me. There was the day when I began to doubt man's sanity. How could you live without knowing for sure what's dawn, what death, what doom, awaited consciousness beyond the tomb? And finally, there was the sleepless night when I decided to explore and fight the foul, the inadmissible abyss, devoting all my twisted life to this. One task, today I am sixty-one, wax wings are berry pecking a cicada sings. The little scissors I am holding are a dazzling synthesis of sun and star. I stand before the window and I pair my fingernails and vaguely am aware of certain flinching likenessness. The thumb, a grosser sun, the index lean and glum, college astronomer star over blue. The middle fellow, a tall priest I knew, the feminine fourth finger, an old flirt, and little pinky clinging to her skirt, and I make mouths as I snip off the thin strips of what Aunt Maud used to call scarf skin. Maud Shade was eighty when a sudden hush fell on her life. We saw the angry flush and torsion of paralysis assail her noble cheek. We moved her to Pinedale, famed for its sanitarium. There she'd sit in the glassed sun and watch the fly that lit upon her dress and then upon her wrist. Her mind kept fading in the growing mist. She still could speak. She paused and groped, and found what seemed at first a serviceable sound. But from adjacent cells, impostors took the place of woods she needed, and her look spelt imploration as she sought in vain to reason with the monsters in her brain. What moment in the gradual decay does resurrection choose? What year? What day? Who has the stopwatch? Who rewinds the tape? Are some less lucky, or do all escape? A syllogism. Other men die, but I am not another, therefore I'll not die. Space is a swarming in the eyes and time, a stinging in the ears. In this hive I'm in, locked up. Yet if prior to life we had been able to imagine life, what mad, impossible, unutterably weird, wonderful nonsense it might have appeared. So why join in the vulgar laughter? Why scorn a hereafter none can verify? The Turks delight, the future liars the talks, with Socrates and Proust and Cyprus walks, the seraph with his six flamingo wings, and Flemish hells and porcupines and things. It isn't that we dream too wild the dream. The trouble is that we do not make it seem sufficiently unlikely, for the most we can think of is a domestic ghost. How ludicrous these efforts to translate into one's private tongue a public fate, instead of poetry divinely terse, disappointed notes, insomnia's mean verse. Life is a message scribbled in the dark, anonymous, espied on a pine's bark, as we were walking home the day she died, an empty emerald case squat and frog-eyed, hugging the trunk and its companion piece, a gumlog ant, that Englishman in Nice, a proud and happy linguist, Genois, la prost de ska, meaning that he fed the poor seagulls. La Fontaine was wrong, that is the mandible, live the song. And so I pare my nails and muse and hear Your steps upstairs and all is right, my dear. Sybil, throughout our high school days I knew Your loveliness, but fell in love with you During an outing of the senior class To New Y Falls, we luncheoned on damp grass. Our teacher of geology discussed the cataract. Its roar and rainbow dust made the tame park romantic. I reclined, then April's haze immediately behind. Your slender back and watched your neat small head Bend to one side, one palm with fingers spread between a star of trillium and a stone, pressed on the turf, a little flying bone, kept twitching. Then you turned and offered me a thimble of bright metallic tea. Your profile has not changed, the glistening teeth, biting the careful lip, the shade beneath, the eye from the long lashes, the peach down, rubbing the cheekbone, the dark silky brown of hair brushed up from the temple and from nape. The very naked neck, the Persian shape, of nose and eyebrow, you kept it all, and on still nights we hear the waterfall. Come and be worshipped, come and be caressed, my dark Vanessa, crimson bard, my blessed, my admiral butterfly, explain, how could you, in the gloam of lilac lane, have let uncouth, hysterical John Shade blubber your face and ear and shoulder blade? We had been married forty years at least, four thousand times your pillow had been creased by our two heads. Four hundred thousand times the tall clock with the hoarse Westminster chimes has marked our common hour. How many more free calendars shall grace the kitchen door? 
I love you when we were standing on the lawn, peering at something in a tree. It's gone. It was small. It might come back. All this voice in a whisper softer than a kiss. I love you when you call me to admire a jet pink trail above the sunset fire. I love you when you're humming as you pack a suitcase or the farcical car sack with round trip zipper. And I love you most when, with a pensive nod, you greet her ghost and hold her first toy on your palm or look at a postcard from her found in a book. She might have been you, me, or some quaint blend. Nature chose me so as to wench and rend. Your heart and mine. At first we'd smile and say, All little girls are plump, or Jim McVeigh, the family occultist, will cure you that slight squint in no time. And later, she'll be quite pretty, you know, and trying to assuage. The swelling torment, that's the awkward age. She should take riding lessons, you would say, your eyes and mine not meeting. She should play tennis or badminton, less starch, more fruit. She may not be a beauty, but she's cute. It was no use, no use, the prizes won. In French and history, no doubt, were fun. At Christmas parties, games were rough, no doubt, and one shy little guest might be left out. But let's be fair, while children of her age were cast as elves and fairies on the stage, that she'd help paint for the school pantomime, my gentle girl appeared as Mother Time, a bent chairwoman, with slop pail and broom, and like a fool I sobbed in the men's room. Another winter was scraped, scooped away, the toothwort white haunted our woods in May. Summer was power mode and autumn burned, alas the dingy signet never turned, into a wood duck and again your voice, but this is prejudice, you should rejoice, that she is innocent, why overstress the physical, she wants to look a mess. Virgins have written some resplendent books, love making is not everything, Good looks are not that indispensable. And still old Pan would call from every painted hill. And still the demons of her pity spoke. No lips would shed lipstick of her smoke. The telephone that rang before a ball every two minutes in San Rosa Hall. For her would never ring. And with a great screeching of tires on gravel to the gate. Out of the lacquered light, a white scarfed bow. Would never come for her, she'd never go. A dream of gauze and jasmine to that dance. We sent her through a chateau in France. And she returned in tears, with new defeats, new miseries. On days when all the streets of College Town led to the game, she'd sit on the library steps and read or knit. Mostly alone she'd be, or with that nice, frail roommate, now a nun, and once or twice with a Korean boy who took my course. She had strange fears, strange fantasies, strange force of character, as though she spent three nights investigating certain sounds and lights in an old barn. She twisted words, pot, Top, spider, ridips, and power was red wop. She called you a didactic, Katie did, and hardly ever smiled, and when she did, it was a sign of pain. She criticized ferociously our projects, and with eyes, expressionless, sit on her tumbled bed, spreading her swollen feet, scratching her head, with psoriatic fingernails and moan, murmuring dreadful words in monotone. She was my darling, difficult morose, but still my darling. You remember those almost unruffled evenings when we played mahjong or she tried on your furs which made her almost fetching and the mirror smiled. The lights were merciful, the shadows mild. Sometimes I'd help her with a Latin text or she'd be reading in her bedroom next to my fluorescent lair and you would be in your own study, twice your mood from me. And I would hear both voices now and then. Mother, what's Grimpen? What is that? Grim pen. Pause in your guarded solium. Then again, mother, what's chatonic? That too, you'd explain, appending, would you like a tangerine? No, yes, what does sempaternal mean? You'd hesitate and lustily I'd roar, the answer from my desk through the closed door. It does not matter what it was she read, some phony modern poem that she said, in English lit to be a document, and gaze and compelling. What this meant, nobody cared. The point is that the three chambers, then bound by you and her and me, now form a triptych or a three-act play in which portrayed events forever stay. I think she always nursed a small mad hope. I'd recently finished my book on Pope. Jane Dean, my typist, offered her one day to meet Pete Dean, a cousin, Jane's fiancé. Would then take all of them in her new car, a score of miles to a Hawaiian bar. The boy was picked up at quarter past. I didn't know why. Sleet glazed the roads at last. They found the place when suddenly Pete Dean, clutching his brow, exclaimed that he had clean, forgotten an appointment with a chum who landed in jail if he, Pete, did not come. 
etc. She'd said she understood. After he'd gone, the three young people stood before the Azure entrance for a while. Puddles were neon barred, and with a smile, she said she'd be de trop. She'd much prefer just going home. Her friends escorted her to the bus stop and left, but she, instead of riding home, got off at Looking Head. You scrutinized your wrist. It's 8.15, and here time forked. I'll turn it on. The screen in its blank broth evolved a lifelike blur and music welled. He took one look at her and shot a death ray at well-meeting Jane. A male hand traced from Florida to Maine, the curving arrows of Aeolian wars. You said that later, a quartet of bores, two writers and two critics, would debate the cause of poetry on Channel 8. A niff came powering under white rotating petals in a vernal right, to kneel before an altar in a wood where various articles of toilet stood. I went upstairs and read a galley proof, and heard the wind roll marbles on the roof. See the blind beggar dance, the cripple sing, has unmistakably the vulgar ring of its preposterous age. Then came your call, my tender mockingbird up from the hall. I was in time to overhear brief fame and have a cup of tea with you. My name was mentioned twice, as usual just behind one oozy footstep frost. Sure you don't mind? I'll catch you extant plain, because you know, if I don't come by midnight with the dough. And there there was a kind of travel log. A host narrator took us through the fog of a March night where headlights from afar approached and grew like a dilating star to the green indigo and tawny sea, which we had visited in 33, nine months before her birth. Now it was all pepper and salt and hardly could recall that first long ramble, the relentless light, the flock of sails, one blue among the white, clashed queerly with the sea, and two were red. The man in the old blazer crumbling bread, the crowd in gulls insufferably loud, and one dark pigeon waddling in the crowd. Was that the phone you listened at the door? Nothing. Picked up the program from the floor. More headlights in the fog. There was no sense in window rubbing, only some white fence in the reflector poles passed by unmasked. Are we quite sure she's acting right, you asked? It's technically a blind date, of course. Well, shall we try the preview of Remorse? And we allowed, in all tranquility, the famous film to spread its charmed marquee. The famous face flowed in, fair and inane, the parted lips, the swimming eyes, the grain of beauty on the cheek, odd gallicism, and the soft form dissolving in the prism of corporate desire. I think she said, I'll get off here, it's only lock and head. Yes, that's okay, grippling the stang, she peered at ghostly trees. Bus stopped, bus disappeared. Thunder above the jungle? No, not that. Pat Pink, our guest. Anti-atomic chat. Eleven struck. You sighed. Well, I'm afraid there's nothing else of interest. You played network roulette. The dial turned and tricked. Commercials were beheaded. Faces flicked. An open mouth in midsung was struck out. An imbecile with sideburns was about to use his gun. But you were much too quick. A jovial negro raised his trumpet. Trick. Your ruby ring made life and laid the law. Oh, switch it off. And as life snapped, we saw a pinhead light dwindle and die in black infinity. Out of his lakeside shack, a watchman, Father Time, all gray and bent, emerged with his uneasy dog and went along the reedy bank. He came too late. You gently yawned and stacked away your plate. We heard the wind. We heard it rush and throw twigs at the window pane. Phone ringing? No. I helped you with the dishes. The tall clock kept on demolishing young root old rock. Midnight, you said. What's midnight to the young? And suddenly a festive blaze was flung. Across five cedar trunks, snow patches showed, and a patrol car on our bumpy road came to a crunching stop. Retake, retake. People have thought she tried to cross the lake at Lock and Neck, where zesty skaters crossed from X to Y on days with special frost. Others suppose she might have lost her way. By turning left from Bridge Road, and some say she took her poor young life. I know, you know. It was a night of thaw, a night of blow, with great excitement in the air. Black spring stood just around the corner, shivering, in the wet starlight and on the wet ground. A lake lay in the mist, its ice half-drowned. A blurry shape stepped off the reedy bank into a crackling, gulping swamp and sank. <laughs>